Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and welcome to part 4 of Geologic Time. So before we go any further, let's just quickly get the code word out of the way. So the code word for this presentation is MINION, I repeat MINION, that is M-I-N-I-O-N, -I -I MINION. So please write that down, put it somewhere safe because you'll need it for the code word quiz. So we've been discussing uh, radioactive decay and how we can use the radioactive decay taking place in minerals to date rocks. So the question is, is well, are there any other methods that we can use to date our rock? Well, yes, we, th there are a couple of other methods which are also helpful to geologists. The next method we can use is something called fission track dating. So in the case of fish and track dating, what we have is we have a mineral, and that mineral contains uranium. Now it has to be uranium, because we are using the isotope uranium-238, and uranium-238 is present in very, very large concentrations. And so this means that there's going to be, in this particular zircon crystal here, which is this, this colorless crystal right here, there's going to be quite a lot of uranium-238 in that crystal. And what you can see here is this dark line around the edge of the crystal. This is called a radiation halo and you can see the same thing around this zircon crystal here which is surrounding, well you can see the same thing in this pyroxene crystal which contains this zircon right here. So what's happening is is the uranium within the zircon crystal is decaying and it's throwing out an alpha particle as part of that decay. So in some cases what's happening is that alpha particle that's created as this crystal decays is being thrown out and it's smashing into the mineral that contains the zircon. So in this case we have a crystal of biotite which is this brown crystal. And you can see the alpha particles have been flying out from this zircon crystal and they've been smashing into the biotite crystal creating this dark halo which is called the radiation halo. And so what we can do is we can use this process of damage to actually help us date a mineral. Because, once again, radioactive decay is a constant. And that means all we have to do is we have to simply count the amount of, uh, well, we have to simply uh, come up with a way of quantifying the damage done, and then we can, you know, we can work out how long would it have, would it have taken for that much damage to have occurred. So in the case of fish and track dating, your preferred mineral is something like apatite, although you can use zircon, mica, or volcanic glass. Now, the reason we like apatite is because apatite is, once again, it's a relatively common mineral. So it's found in a lot of igneous rocks, and it's easy to work with. Okay. So the thing about apatite and zircon and mica and other things is that they will typically contain radioactive isotopes and uranium-238 is the one that we're particularly interested in because it's present in quite high concentrations and this means that you're going to get lots and lots of damage produced by alpha decays which are being thrown out as the uh, uranium-238 breaks down. So the particle, the alpha particle, is emitted by the decay of 238 and it smashes into the surrounding mineral. So if we have an apatite crystal, and in that apatite crystal we have um, some uranium within the crystal, well as that uranium breaks down, it kicks out an alpha particle and that alpha particle goes smashing through the apatite crystal lattice, damaging it as it goes. Now the damage is not actually visible. However, if we take the crystal and we dip it in acid, well, the acid will dissolve the areas that have been damaged faster than the rest of the crystal. So typically we'll take our apatite crystal, we will uh, dunk it in some hydrofluoric acid, hydrofluoric acid is a very, very strong acid, and it will dissolve the areas of the crystal that have been damaged. And so what does it do? Well, here we go. So this is the, this is our basic idea. So here's our apatite crystal, and within our apatite crystal we have some uranium. So that uranium decays, fires out an alpha particle, and that alpha particle goes smashing into the crystal lattice of the apatite crystal, damaging it as it goes. And so what, what happens is, is we then come along later, we take our apatite crystal, we dunk it in acid, and the acid is able to dissolve away the damage done by the alpha particle. So you can see you get these lines. Each one of these lines is damage produced by a single alpha particle. So this is when an alpha particle has gone smashing into the crystal lattice. Now the thing is, is once again, radioactive decay is a constant. So 
for instance, we might, so we know that maybe, let's say, it for every 10 million years, you would get 1,000 alpha particles being produced. So you would see 1,000 lines in your crystal. Okay, so all you have to do then is you just simply have to take your crystal and count how many of these fission tracks, these lines you can see. And you just simply count how many there are and then you will know how long it would have taken to form that many fission tracks. And therefore you have dated your crystal. And once you date the crystal, you've dated the rock. So fission track dating is a very simple technique. It doesn't require much to actually get it to work, so it's quite cost effective. However, the thing is, is it does have a couple of minor problems. The first problem is that uh, apatite is very, it's not exactly a particularly robust mineral, so it can get damaged quite quickly, you know, quite easily. So, fission track dating is also useful for only a relatively short window. So you can date material which is between 40,000 and 1.5 million years old, and that's pretty much it. Once you get outside that window, the technique isn't really that usable. So you can only use fission track dating to date things which are rather young. So the final dating technique we have is called carbon dating, and I'm sure it's something you've probably heard of before. So carbon has three isotopes, carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. Now carbon-12 and carbon-13 are both stable, so we're not really interested in them. It's carbon-14 that we're interested in. So carbon-14 forms when a cosmic ray coming from the sun strikes an atom in the upper atmosphere. So this cosmic ray comes flying from the sun, comes shooting through space, smashes into the Earth's atmosphere, and as that cosmic ray is passing through the Earth's atmosphere, it plows into an atom of something, oxygen, nitrogen, helium, hydrogen, who knows? It plows into it. And that cosmic ray destroys the nucleus of that atom. It blows it up. So you've got, you've got neutrons and protons flying everywhere. Now, if one of the neutrons that's produced by this, um, by this destruction hits a nitrogen-14 atom, remember nitrogen is the most common uh, element in the Earth's atmosphere, what will happen then is the nitrogen-14 will... Uh, so one neutron hits nitrogen-14, it can be absorbed by the nucleus and a proton is admitted. Okay. So when the neutron hits the nitrogen-14, it will lead to a proton being kicked out. This means that the, um, the proton number has decreased by one. So you're no longer, you, don't, you no longer have nitrogen, you have carbon. So we've taken nitrogen-14 and we've turned it into carbon-14 by, by hitting it with a neutron. So carbon-14 is produced at a constant rate, once again. So every day, pretty much exactly the same amount of carbon-14 is produced. So we know its abundance relative to carbon-12 and carbon-13, because the amount of carbon-14 in, in the Earth system, should I say, doesn't really change. Now, the thing about any form of carbon is that it gets incorporated into organic tissue at a constant rate. So we know how much carbon there is in the how much carbon fourteen there is in the atmosphere, and we know the rate at which that carbon fourteen is going to become incorporated into organic material. That means you know, that means leaves, that means tree bark, that means bones. That, well, not really bones. That means muscle. That means skin. All of these things will contain carbon, and some of that carbon will be carbon fourteen. And throughout your entire life, you are constantly adding carbon-14 to your body. So you're constantly replenishing carbon-14 in your body. So the problem is, is well, actually, do you know what? Before I could take that step, I'm just going to say one more thing. So the carbon-14 that you know, you've got in your body is added to your body every time you eat something. So every time you eat meat or you eat you know, some plant, you are incorporating carbon-14 into your body. Now, the thing is, is obviously the carbon-14 that's in your body is also going to be decaying because it's radioactive. So that means you are constantly losing carbon-14, but you're constantly adding new carbon-14 to it to replace what's been lost. So your body has pretty much a constant level of carbon-14 in it. And this level of carbon-14 is maintained as long as you're alive. Because the thing is, is as soon as you die, obviously you stop eating. 
and so you're going to so you will no longer be adding new carbon 14 into your body so when you when a plant dies when another animal dies no more carbon 14 goes into the body so that means within the within the uh, the body the carbon 14 that remains is going to be breaking down to nitrogen 14 and once again it happens at a set rate the great thing is is that we know how much carbon 14 the body will have started with and so we know how much carbon 14 we started with we know how much carbon 14 we have left when we actually measure the organic material and so all we have to know is how long will it take us to get from the starting amount of carbon 14 to the amount that we have when we do the analysis and once again that's easy because the carbon 14 decays at a constant rate and so it doesn't take much effort at all to do that calculation and when you've done that you have your age now carbon dating is only effective for organic material because it has to contain carbon and the organic material typically has to be 50,000 years or younger that's about as old as you can go now you can push it to 75,000 years old but you need a very large sample and you need to use special preparation techniques and you need to analyze for an extended period of time and so yes you, you can analyze material that's up to 75,000 years old but it's very expensive and there is of course one more problem because nothing in life is easy so human beings being the geniuses that we are we decided that one of the ways we would test our nuclear weapons is that we would blow them up in the open air good work us so the thing about the nuclear testing that took took place in the early and mid 20th century is that it actually increased the amount of carbon 14 in the atmosphere because think about it when a nuclear bomb goes off it throws neutrons everywhere and those neutrons are going to go smashing into nitrogen 14 isotopes in the atmosphere turning them into carbon 14. so what we see is that before 1950 we have a we have a, a set amount of carbon 14 in the atmosphere after 1950 where we suddenly start to see the effects of all these nuclear explosions we see the amount of carbon 14 in the atmosphere actually increase so what we have in what we have in geology and dating in general is we have something which is referred to as pb so that means anything any organic material that's essentially forms after 1950 will have the effects of the nuclear uh, nuclear detonations so we'll see an increased level of carbon 14 in the sample and we have to take that into account when we analyze the material anything that was formed before 1950 we don't have to make that correction so yeah good work us well done humans anyway that's it everyone so uh, thank you for listening to the presentation so once again please make sure you have that code word somewhere safe because you're going to need it for the code word quiz and i'll see you in the next lecture